Um, so good afternoon. Yeah, thanks for joining uh, ACANS Educators Climate Crisis Workshop number two. Um, it looks like, yeah, we've got about 80 people on the call at the moment. Um, and from people signed up from 30 different institutions, um, as we can see from the sort of Eventbrite uh, stuff. Um, we've got a lot of content to cover to, in today's workshop, so time people can be kept quite strict, so we finish on time. Uh, firstly, some Zoom rules, which I'm sure most are familiar, familiar with at this stage. Uh, we'll be muting everyone's mics until the breakout rooms. In addition, we will be recording the start of today's workshop, but not the breakout rooms or any sort of discussion that follows. Um, should there be any major interruptions and we're forced to close the event, we'll issue another uh, Zoom link via the event right as quickly as we can. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please do pop these into the chats at chat box um, and an ACAN host will sort of be able to help you directly. Um, likewise, feel free to use the chat box to sort of chat and table any other ideas as sort of going through. Um, so today, following this short introduction at the start, we'll, we'll plan to go as following. We'll be hearing from three guest speakers, each of whom will have 10 minutes to table some of the ideas and explorations of their own with regards to briefs. Um, following on from this, our technical team will break the session out into smaller breakout rooms to discuss uh, two questions over a 40 minute period, and this will be done automatically within Zoom. Uh, following on from this, we ask each group to feedback a very short summary of their breakout rooms efforts and discussions. Um, and we'll conclude with some closing comments and a selection of tables questions for guest speakers, um, which will be picking up through from in the chat throughout the session. Um, and last but not least, uh, ACAN's very own virtual pub, the Bishop Arms, will be a link circulated at the end. Um, so firstly, we'll just to give a brief overview about ACAN for those unfamiliar with its activities. Um, ACAN is a network of individuals within architecture and the related built environment professions taking action to address the twin crises of climate and ecological breakdown. ACAN exists to address the ways our built environment is made, operated and renewed in response to the climate emergency. As a network of individuals, we channel personal energy, expertise and action towards a common goal, the systematic change of our profession and the construction industry as a whole. We see this as a matter of urgency. So ACAN is led by seeking to achieve three overarching aims which help to focus the very activities and efforts of the collective. Firstly, being decarbonisation, secondly, ecological regeneration, and the third, cultural transformation. The wider collective is structured around eight thematic groups, as can be seen here. And each thematic group uh, has a working group focusing on developing and delivering campaigns, which are guided by the overarching uh, ACAN aims as previously mentioned. So we're part of the education group, as we can see here in orange. Um, so today is part of the education group's climate curriculum campaign, which launched two months ago, and is focusing on pursuing and supporting the changes needed in education this coming academic year and onwards. Uh, more details about this can be seen on the ACAN uh, website. So we recognise there's a, already a quality of climate and ecologically related teaching occurring in many schools of architecture. So through this inter-institutional workshop today, we're seeking to support a mass cross pollinization of ambitious ideas and approaches that are already underway. Given the limited time today, this assembly is about crowdsourcing ideas, sharing knowledge and developing actions rather than being selectional or making executive decisions. We see this workshop as the start of a process rather than aiming to reach any kind of synthesised conclusion in two hours. So, however, the start, you know, the start of the academic year will be shortly upon us, and ACAN is a group of action, so we would encourage you all to be as well. So, we encourage everyone to speak freely and candidly in these sessions, which we hope our guest speakers will set a precedent for. So, this does require everyone to be here in good faith and sort of bring a positive attitude. All of this is based on the practice of radical inclusivity and the values and behaviours that ACAN practices are set out here. So today's session um, follows on from our workshop last month and for those unable to join that session we focused on discussing the obstacles and opportunities at large in architectural education while today's session is focusing on briefs being deployed this coming academic year. Be it design, technical, history and theory or strategic briefs and how we can share some ideas and, and work together to improve our collective approach and better our education offerings to consider ecology, the climate um, and cultural shifts needed. In addition, last week we had a similar workshop with SCOSA and the RIBA uh, where, we, where we took forward and tabled the selection of the collaborative points made from the first tutors workshop. These were largely focused on uh, taking forth and tabling um, the identified structural issues and, further, and furthering the discussion with heads of schools and their abilities to address these. So as identified through both these workshops, briefs are a notable point of action and opportunity in education. Many university briefs and those that write them, be it 
tutors or the students themselves have an autonomous autonomity and self-determination that makes them a prime point of investigation this coming year. There's simply not enough time to wait for a top-down approach to be prescribed through curriculum, which may take years to be fully realised, validated, or have the confidence that is needed to tackle such vastly complicated issues as they evolve and worsen. In addition, a portfolio of approaches is needed. There's no silver bullet to tackling these paradigm issues. Issues so complex that they're going to, and currently do, affect, affect all aspects of life and culture globally. As a result, there are a huge number of intersections that need to be explored, valued and shared if architecture is to have a positive role to play in this global change. So students enrolling in undergraduate this year will likely qualify as architects in 10 years from now and to a vastly different climate of operation, social expectation and professionalism as outlined by the ROBA's The Way Ahead scheme that we heard from previously and the ROBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide. So there's not much time to lose really on these, in pursuing these. So to prompt, prompt our collective thoughts and briefs and the efforts in the breakout rooms, we'll hear three short presentations. Uh, first, that will be Duncan Baker Brown, an architect and educator at Brighton University and recently elect member of the RIBA Council. Duncan's going to be discussing his expertise at Brighton, experiences at Brighton and ambitions um, and aspirations of further integrating conversations between technology and professional practice. I hope that's right, Duncan. Um, and secondly, uh, up will be Kieran Malik. Kieran teaches on the environment and technical uh, studies courses at the Architecture Association, as well as Central St. Martins, Kingston University and Oxford Brooks. He's a structural engineer and before that a secondary school teacher and is trying to make climate design more accessible. And finally, Professor Lindsay Bremner, Principal Investigator of Monsoon Assemblages and the a European Research Council funded project at Westminster University, developing a more than human approach to viewing the South Asian monsoon. Lindsay will be tabling some thoughts on her MRH teaching experiences in participation with the modern student assemblages, principally around the ideas of climate as a grounds for design. Um, so unfortunately, given the larger format of today's session, we're gonna save questions into the end section. So do post these in the chat um, and we'll be picking up on them and monitoring as we go through. Um, but now I'll hand over to Duncan. So Duncan, if you're ready to screen share, or if you've, I don't know if you've got a presentation or not. Um, so I don't actually, can you hear me? I don't, I don't have a presentation. Um, I just wanted to speak if that's okay. So that's more, um, that's okay. I don't know if, uh, if our host can spotlight you so everyone can sort of see you uh, up big and in, in your face, but yeah, take it away whenever you're ready. Duncan. I don't mind being small. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, hello everybody, um, and thank you, uh, ACAM, for inviting me to, uh, to speak. Um, yeah, I've, I've been in the world of academia since 1994, and that was when, um, as a graduating student from the University of Brighton, post-grad, um, my partner and I both graduated, and pretty quickly after that won a competition to design the house of the future. It was an RIBA competition, and um, it was an off-grid, sustainable uh, house of the future. Uh, employing circular economy techniques, et cetera, et cetera. So that was exciting, and we pretty quickly got invited back to teach. And within two years, 1996, 97, we'd set up a uh, RED, which is Research into Environment and Design, with Professor Susanna Hayden, who went on to the RCA and uh, uh, Imperial and Westminster with RED. Now, what was interesting is because I was mixing practice with teaching, uh, I hadn't really got my head around how to really get uh, good research embedded into my practice um, but pretty quickly we were doing uh, environmental and it was called a green audit for Peckham partnerships so we were auditing the building practice of London Borough Southwark uh, and doing the sort of green version of it so this was in 1997 and pretty quickly after that we were in charge of visioning what urban sustainability would be for the Greenwich Millennium Village that got us into about the year 2000 2001 so we felt like wow it's happening we're impactful we're in our late 20s early 30s it's happening then it all went a bit sort of quiet and i carried on teaching uh, in postgraduate uh, in the postgraduate school in, at the university of brighton together with my partner ian and we had various design studios we named them for two or three years unplugged and the last one we did was hyper local and again this is 10 years ago and four years ago in both cases they were looking at uh, unplugged in particular was looking at cities and the systems and flows uh, as linear flows and turning them into circular ones this was in 2010 
I think the most impactful things we've done though are the live projects. So I did one with Channel 4 in 2008 called The House That Kevin Built. And that was actually a project that turned into a live project for our students. And it then morphed into 2013. It actually ran from 2012 to 2014. And it was the Waste House, which is what we're sort of known for. It's not a house, it's a building on site on campus at the University of Brighton. And that building, the design and the construction of that building involves design uh, students, um, that was architects and interior architects, as well as uh, students from uh, a sort of sister college, a technology college, um, Brighton Tech. So students, they're learning building trades and their learning modules uh, and curricula were um, satisfied by working on the design and the construction of what became the Brighton Waste House. So that's sort of living the dream, a live project involved 360 students. Uh, people couldn't believe, you know, we had kids as young as 15, because at technical colleges, some of the, them are as young as that, uh, on a real build, permanent building site, uh, permanent building on a building site, uh, learning this stuff. And what's been, what's really gratifying with a project like that is, in the last couple of years, we've had carpenters graduating uh, from uh, what's now called the Brighton Met College, and the only life project they've ever worked on is the Waste House. So now they're graduating and working in industry with that sort of knowledge. Since 2015, we've also had, um, uh, we've been able to annually issue um, a Waste House Award for circuit, the Circular Economy. And that's across sort of arts and humanities. So that can be a fashion design student, textiles, architecture, whatever. And it's interesting, for the first few years, it was always the uh, textiles and the product designers who were winning. Um, and we were able to set up that award, which has a ca cash prize because we got a special prize um, at the Sterling Prize in uh, 2015, uh, the Stephen Lawrence Award, we got, the, we got a prize there. So that, that was good. Since then, it's been interesting because up to that point, I think in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, we were teaching across the school. And then we got narrower and narrower and we were sort of pigeonholed as the green sustainable people. And it really did feel like we were that sort of awkward member of the family who, you know, face to face, everybody's sort of very pleasant to do about. But when you move out of the room, they're taking a mickey out of you. And it's, it's been quite interesting to see how that has changed in the last, I'd only say, 18 months. Um, however, at the University of Brighton School of Architecture, we do have a sustainable design MA, but it's not in, it's, ac it's actually a, a sort of written theoretical thing. It's not a practical course. So it's not like, um, it's not like architecture. Um, and interestingly, we've got uh, a new colleague who's now running product design, which is part of the School of Art and Design, who is part of the Fab City Network. So he came from the RCA. So we're sort of tooling up as a school. But what I've been doing for the last six years is, is coordinating technology and practices in the undergraduate school. And that's where we've in a way been able to be most radical around the climate emergency. So it's not something we started two years ago. We've been doing it for eight years. And I've got a team that includes structural engineers, environmental engineers, environmental scientists, and architects. And we teach the technology component to, uh, to the undergraduate students in architecture. And I also run professional practices for the undergraduates as well. And in both cases, we've been able to be really quite radical and it's been really encouraging the last couple of years to have uh, the architects climate action network etc raising the profile of this because in a way it's given our modules more credibility but um i interviewed our students at the end of this year because by the way we launched la this time last year when we went back to uh university uh, we had this thing the future we want which was uh, having the sort of issues associated with the climate emergency raised across the whole school, the whole school got together and discussed issues around the climate and ecological emergency and a response to it. And potentially it's really interesting. We've got architects, interior architects, planners, product designers, all in the same room. And then we also had a week long workshop where people could work together, cross practice, thinking about the issues associated with this, which was great. But at the end of this year in, in um, June, I interviewed about 25 students. It was a week after ACAN did a presentation to our student society, actually. And I said, you know, how did you think that uh, the sort of curriculum dealt with climate issues? And uh, they said they still, to be honest, they still thought it was like a secondary or tertiary issue. And the reason being 
is because me and my team are sort of banging on about it for want of a better phrase all the time uh, and have it setting you know lots of different types of projects um, from visioning concepts around the circular economy or uh, um, the climate emergency through to actually making things but it's under the sort of headline of tech technology and professional practices and in the studio world the world of design which is for, for reasons of riba uh, criteria is sort of teased away from technology and practices into different modules they see design as the number one thing so for me what's disappointing at the moment is they think that design is not necessarily preoccupied as always preoccupied as it should be with the climate emergency but maybe as a you know the technology or the technologists can fix it and that's definitely not what we want to be teaching people so moving forward i'm quite optimistic actually um i am actually the head of technology and practices but i'm I'd asked for my uh, job title to be changed, and I'm now climate literacy champion because I, I don't want to be branded with tech and practices. Because obviously, in the real world, there is no difference between design, tech, and practice. It's what it's it's the, it's everything we do. So it was interesting with the graduation show this summer because I thought it looked like the way because we had to present all our work online like everybody did. It looked like we had a climate literate cohort of students. What concerns me still is even this year, some of the studios, and we do vertical studios in the undergraduate school, still didn't do the sustainability stuff. So we're still having a, a sort of discussion, even though we integrate tech and design tutors together, we've still got this sort of discussion and some of the, tech, uh, some of the studio leaders aren't bought into it yet or don't know what to do and are too proud to sort of say, we don't know what to do. And one of the best things, I'm going to wrap up on this, one of the best conferences I ever went to had this breakout area, which was called Carbon Confessions. And it was basically a lot of the quite well-known architects dealing with sustainability, admitting where they'd gone wrong, because you learn most from your mistakes. And I really think we're in an era now where we've got to try and find some time for our academics to learn more, to learn what they need to do to become climate literate a lot of them aren't it's not where they've had to be and they just need to admit that and we are in an era now we've got the first cohort of climate strikers joining our schools this year so you know we've, we've got a climate literate cohort of students thank you very much so i really think it's in the it's the responsibility of the academics to find some time so, to do cpd at the end of the day and you know they all do their research but they need to become climate literate and that's where i want to end thank you very much Great, thank you very much, Duncan. Um, Kieran, are you ready? You've got a presentation to square, so if you want to share your screen and take over uh, when you're ready. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Oops. I've, have I messed this up? Yep. Yep, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's fine, uh, it's already gone to the end. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for having me, um, and it's great to be part of this. And uh, I'm gonna kind of, I come at this from a very practical kind of like standpoint. So I, I, I try to, I'm just gonna just, I'm gonna show some of the ways that I've tried to do it. Um, and hopefully that'll aid some discussion um, and some people can give me some feedback on it. So I think one of the things that I, that I kind of want to highlight is the fact that it's, it's an emergency and this is now. So if we're at this, this is from uh, the Letty document. And if this is the point that we're at now and we have students joining us this year, that by 2020, in about three, two or three years, 60% of, according to Letty kind of time frame, 60% of the work that we should be doing should be, uh, should be net zero design. So that means that students that are gonna be graduating are gonna be, should be graduating into a completely different world. And um, what is needed is a real significant change. And if things haven't changed significantly, then we're not going to hit these targets. And this is a, a kind of route map that Arup put together to kind of look at all the ways that the UK emits carbon and then reduce and then kind of work out ways that they could reduce each of the industries could reduce in order to hit that target. This was this was done a while before the government did theirs so it's a bit out of date but it still has some really interesting findings so for example just honing in on the construction industry it's talking about there's a huge need for efficiency across the industry. It talks about a, a reduction in the industry that's quite significant um, and it highlights areas that we could be looking to improve so for example talking about site efficiency talking about the transport 
and talking about the way that we design. Um, and I think one of the hard parts of teaching this is that there is no correct answer and I don't think any one person has the correct answer. And if you do know that person, I would love to meet them. But I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the ways that I've been trying to do it and approach this and develop, develop ways that I could talk to students about it. And one of the first ones is that I've been trying to make it accessible. I think if you ask people or if you ask students to just kind of design uh, to, to sort of stop climate change, you're going to be met with blank faces. It's, it's a huge, huge topic. And so I've been trying to, um, as Duncan said, educate myself, but at the same time, try to break it, make the information much more accessible to people. So I do these, I do diagrams to kind of make these points that I include in my lectures. Um, and it becomes a really interesting talking point. So I've, I've brought this up into tutorials at some of the other schools. And the fact that one of the first things that I'm suggesting is that they don't build, like, do they have to, do they have to even build in their project? Can they justify the need to build in their project? Uh, is not always well received, but I think it's an important point that we should be discussing. And I think justifying the need to build is, an, is part of what they should be doing, or like identifying that they need to build in their design. And then if they are going to build, then they start looking at ways that they can reduce the impact of those designs. One of the other things is that I think it should be measurable. I think, again, that, um, that climate, um, that even those three headings that they can use is, is, is a huge, encompasses a huge area. And so there's lots of different ways of thinking about it. So Reba have got their sustainable outcomes, um, and that's really useful because that has objectives in it and it's, like, it's, it's being promoted. So it's really, it's a useful metric. The other one, for example, you might consider BRIAM or LEAD, and that one's a useful metric to, to teach students about because it gives them like skills that they can apply to industry um, and is comparable with clients. A slightly more, uh, like less common one um, and more ambitious is the Living Building Challenge. Now this, as you can see on the wheel, it, like it's encompassing a lot more, it encompasses everything that the other two do, but it actually covers many more areas that they don't include. So for example, talking about inclusion, universal access, and um, living economy sourcing. And then, like if you go on a really big scale, I would probably, that you could talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that is, one of the advantages of using that is that it's, it applies to the whole world, it allows you to, to think about the whole entire world in your design work. And it's probably like the metric that I actually think is the, the best to use, because um, if you haven't seen this, this is part of the um, IPPC report, on uh, that came out in 2018, and it's talking about the fact that we actually need to hit, we need to achieve all of the sustainable development goals in order to lower emissions and to reach this. And so, for example, it's talking about things, it, again, it comes back to this idea of poverty that we can't, we can, if we achieve all of the other areas, but we don't, but we are, that in order to achieve those, we still have people in poverty, so we haven't really achieved all of those goals. So, Coming to, um, so actually, how do we teach about this? This is one of the images that I had at the end of the end of years is where we do we make structural models and we do structural testing of them. And I was leaving through the back and I saw this, that this is what was the result of those, all those models. And I, I just didn't want to face this ever again coming from our course. So um, one of the things that we've been doing is, being in, is, is making models using biodegradable materials. So the idea that we would teach them about, about arches, about trusses, about beams, and about stability, but all using materials that are biodegradable, so using masking tape, cardboard, spaghetti, and pasta, all the materials that could be, uh, that could be, that were biodegradable and would have no impact at the end. So if these materials were composted, then they would have no impact. And one of the other nice things that we've been doing is that, um, that most of the students end up cooking or doing something much more interesting with their apples at the end of it. Um, one of the other ways that we've been looking at this is through this idea of reusing the components. So we do this kind of series, of, we do this initial test that's only two stories, and then we, actually, we ask the students to reuse those materials to create their next model. And we had some really interesting results. So for example, this was their first model, and they realized that it was far too strong. So actually they were able to then use most of those components into that, that, that second model. And they spray painted everything that was that was reused and so the only new parts were these these here so it's a much more kind of creative way that they could be using their materials in our third year one of the courses that we were doing was uh was this idea to create uh, a greenhouse for trees in the middle of uh, bedford square and 
from a structural point of view, this was really interesting because it created a really ambitious structure, structure that was needed to go over those trees. But the other part is that it, it required you to kind of, by choosing trees that had difficult climactic conditions, it meant that students couldn't just use off-the-shelf solutions, they actually had to think about their water, their heating, their cooling. Um, and so we got them to kind of show that process in some of their designs. Um, so showing the construction of their designs um, and integrating the kind of the drainage system into their designs as well. So, and so this is kind of what some of their ending work looked like. In the fourth year, one of the things we've been talking about is actually carbon calculation. So how do you calculate the carbon? So we chose a really like, simple frame and went through the process of calculating the carbon of that and then thinking, is there ways to create a lower carbon version of that? And so students were coming up with interesting designs like this. Again, they were accounting for the carbon in their structural frames for those. And then one of the last things I've been trying, I think needs to happen is this idea of this whole system approach, this whole design approach. Now this comes from the Bullet Center, which is a really interesting building, which you should, if you, have, if you haven't seen it, it's very interesting because it uses a lot of sustainable features. But it's this idea of that you can only really design your building if you're thinking about all of these systems, if you're thinking about the lifespan of your building, how you're going to have rainwater, grey water, your ventilation strategy, and then that evolves to your final design. And it is a complicated issue, but this is an example of one of my first year students at Central St. Martin's doing this. Now it's not perfect, but it's really good that on a single page, the student is considering all the technical aspects in one area so they can see where they can start using benefits of one to, to solve another one. So they're already thinking about that they're going to need temporary supports to make their structure and they acknowledge that. And they start to think about their sources of noise and where they might use thicker materials in order to achieve that. So they're coming to that whole system approach. And then the last one is this idea of design strategies. Now this is, uh, this, this doesn't make very much sense at the moment. I'm still trying to work my head my way around it, but I'll just kind of get to where I am. The idea is that on this side is a measure of sustainability. So you could be using the SDGs or you could be using a living building challenge, right? So that's just a way that you, that students should be assessing their work or studios could be assessing the work. And then on this side are a series of design strategies that you might incorporate in your project. So for example, you might choose to use circular economy and the circular economy affects these different particular areas. Now I think it's, it's really, it would be great if studios could look at all of these, but I think that's a bit too hard. So what I'm going to, what I suggest actually might be that you choose particular strategies that cover all of the areas and then that's your way of actually embracing all of the sustainable goals if that makes sense so an example of this might be that you have um, that you choose for example for your studio circular economy passive house and urban farming and then by focusing on those it actually means that you have to consider all of these different metrics of doing this so the idea is that the studios would pick the kind of particular strategies that they're interested in and then this would lead into the student's kind of studio work and their technical resolution of those designs. So that's where I'm at with uh, it so far. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kieran. That was really insightful and uh, extremely well explained and dynamic with your drawing. Um, Lindsay, I don't know if you're ready to share your screen. Are you free to take over and unmute yourself when you're ready? I am. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, that's great. Great, thanks. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ben, for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit more, I guess, conceptual and less practical um, than the other two, which have been absolutely fantastic and very useful. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about my experience of setting briefs and running studios explicitly aimed at deepening understanding of climate and ecological crisis as the grounds for design. I'm going to talk about my experience um, in running three studios as part of a European Research Council funded project called Monsoon Assemblages, one in Chennai in South India, one in Bangladesh and one in Myanmar. But I'm not going to discuss these studios in detail, just highlight some of the principles that guided the way the briefs were written and the lessons we learned from them, because I think that might be useful. Right, so the first um, 
Oops, why can't I move this forward? Um, the first, I want to make a really important distinction that guided our briefs, and that's the difference between climate and weather. So, first of all, what is climate? Um, the concept of climate as we understand it today is, un is tied to the advent of satellites that came into being in the 1960s and the establishment of World Weather Watch, which is a global system of observational, telecommunicational and data processing infrastructure by the World Meteorological Organization. And this image is actually of the first ever, the first ever image of the world's weather taken from Tiros um, in 1965. Um, World Weather Watch collects zillions of observational data, some on an hourly basis, and assembles them into stati statistical averages, such as monthly maximum or monthly minimum temperature and so on. These data are then combined with code to parametrically model the climate, its past and its futures. In other words, climate change is a semi-empirical world in which parametrization and tuning are scientific art forms. Climate models are inductive arguments that cannot be proven, but nevertheless make the imagining of future climates under different scenarios possible. So climate and climate change are not empirical or experienced, but constructed through data and models. <laughs> Weather, on the other hand, while it is empirically measured with instruments to produce the data through which it is forecast and projected, is known through the immediacy of embodied experience. It varies from one place to the other at a far finer scale than climate tells us about, that climate data tells us about. It varies from one body to the other and is enmeshed with materials, history, economy and socio-political life. Working class bodies, for instance, weather very differently from upper class bodies for a whole lot of reasons that have very little to do with the weather. So weather is both part of nature and it's also cultural and political. Right, so out of these two concepts of climate and weather, what, sorry, why is this not moving forward? Um, what, did this, what did this mean for brief writing? And I've got three points I want to make here. First of all, in order to increase our repertoire for dealing with climate crisis, we need to integrate science and ethnography, climatic data, and the embodied knowledge that comes from experiences of weather into the design process. While scientific data can tell us about longer term trends, embodied knowledge tells us about the lived experience of environmental change, and both are important for brief writing. The second point I want to make, and this is really the most important conceptual point, I think, is that climate, weather, and what used to be called nature are no longer externalities. We humans are now acknowledging that we're totally enmeshed within them. We are part of the climate, and the climate is part of us. We weather with climate, and it weathers with us. This displaces the subject-object distinction that has underpinned knowledge and design since the Enlightenment. In other words, nature is no longer a backdrop. It's no longer an externality. It's no longer just a resource or a sink, but it's an active force to be worked alongside and with. This does not be, mean projecting agency onto nature, but paying attention to its materiality. For it is through this materiality that nature does things. So for instance, in Chennai, our brief asked students to work with the materiality of monsoon rain by simulating how rain fell on surfaces, filtered into the earth, 
modeled its flows and we asked them to model its flows and blockages and gradually added more complex variables to these simulations to develop into design proposals. So we really need to pay important in, in, give due importance to the materiality of weather and climate in order to understand how they operate and how to design with them. The second point, and this might be debatable, is that climate, weather and ecology don't work along spatially Euclidean lines. They don't follow lines, they're driven by gradients of pressure and temperature differences and so on. Meaning that the well-settled analytical conventions of architectural drawing, namely orthographic projection and perspective, are somewhat useless as representational tools for depicting the volumetric materiality of weather worlds or the intricate web of relations they, that weather weaves with other agencies. So this presents a problem for design. How do you draw the weather? How do you measure the beach? So in our studios, what we did was we turned to the history of meteorological cartography and to simulation in order to try and bring the weather into the realm of representation and therefore of design. And there are other ways of doing this, but we used cartography and simulation. In reflecting on my experience with these studios and their implication for design studio teaching, I just want to raise three more points. First of all, the studios made explicit the question of what matters to architecture. We asked students what matters to architecture and we shifted the question from matters of form to matters of concern. Our studio slowed down the certainties of what architecture is taken to be by refusing to approach questions of form, of structure, or of program as matters of fact. Instead, we approached them as complex, entangled histories and webs of associations, able to be put together in different ways. In other words, architecture needs to pay attention to things normally considered outside of its realm of influence, such as politics, such as kind of material chains of agency and so on. The second thing is, um, our students were frequently asked at reviews, but where is the building? For by identifying or deriving architecture from relations with things like weather, the Monash Studios presented the possibility of the disappearance of architecture altogether. Design was open to the potential of intervening in every geographical space, from the air to the underground, and it scales from software interfaces to territorial infrastructures. And I was interested that the previous speaker spoke about asking the questions, do we actually need buildings? Or is there something else that we can use our design intelligence to do? And finally, what my studio, our studios actually revealed was that the kinds of sensibilities and working methods that the studios engendered rooted in ecological design thinking and reciprocity with the living world are at odds with the reality of the world of architectural practice very often. Despite that some of our graduates have been able to integrate the skills and sensibilities learned in the studios into their practice worlds in some way, I've been aware for some time of the need to build an infrastructure supporting ways of practicing architecture otherwise. And I think it is, um, initiatives, initiatives like ACAN are fundamental to this effort, so I really applaud your efforts. This last slide is just a selection of some resources that might be useful some, for some people that we found extremely useful in our studio. Um, can I go through them very briefly, Ben? Um, um, a vast yeah, machine, yeah, wait, wait, or do you have time or am I finished? Uh, yeah, if, if, I stop? Quick, then, uh, yeah, I think we can do that. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, if, it, if it's quick, I think we can fit it in. Yeah. 
Okay, A Vast Machine is a brilliant book by Paul Edwards, which really is kind of on the history of, of climate infrastructure. The Life of Lions is an anthropologist book by Tim Ingold. These are both really useful resources. Um, and the rest are just some more um, weathered is a book by a geographer called Mike Hulme which is on the difference between weather and climate. And the other three are more architectural references um, as to different ways that people have tackled the kinds of um, problems that I've identified. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Lindsay. that was insightful. Um, George, I don't know if you're ready to introduce the breakout rooms. Uh, so George is gonna give us a quick int introduction for five minutes of how the breakout rooms work, which we're looking forward to sort of discussing. Um, are, you, are you there, yep. George? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we'll be shortly allocating a wider session into breakout rooms of about can I, eight. Sorry, George, can I bring up the presentation? Oh, yes, please. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so everyone will be put in a breakout room of about eight people shortly, um, where you'll be able to continue these discussions with your peers. Each breakout room will be facilitated by an ACAN member and it should be apparent who they are, as this will be indicated in their name and or possibly their background. To build on from ACAN's radical inclusivity principles and values, we would encourage everyone to practice their active listening. If you're a loud person, please be mindful of this. We want you to, your contributions, but remember to make space for others. If you're a quiet person, this is your chance. We've set this up in a way that we can hear from everyone in the room this afternoon. So don't be shy, you have something valuable to contribute. A critical element of this practice is the hand signals, which the facilitator will be picking up to help guide this session. So if everyone can follow along and do this with me now, we should quickly get the hang of this. Number one point, if you have something to say, raise your hand, the facilitator will take notes and come round to you in order. Two, direct points. Skip secure the single point, this should only be used for a short point or comment necessarily relevant to the person speaking. Try not to abuse this one. And number three, shake. Shake your hands up high if you're in agreement with what is being said. Use liberally as and when needed. These hand signals help to make the session more interactive and help focus people's attention on the discussion, as the facilitator will help guide from speaker to speaker. We would encourage everyone to put their videos on and contribute to the session in this way. Not only is it crucial for the hand signals and facilitator, but it helps to create a much more involved virtual workshop environment. The breakout rooms will be structured and will run as follows. Everyone is to have a short 30 seconds introduction. What's your name? What course you do? What year groups do you teach? You will then discuss the first question, question of approximately 15 minutes. The facilitator will cap this off with a short break before continuing to question two. Um, leaving enough time for the group to summarise their discussions at the end. To help with this, um, a document has been set up to organise our collective thoughts. We intend to use Google Slides, which everyone should be able to access. These are live documents where you will be able to see each other's comments being written in real time. A link to this will be placed in the chat shortly and you should be able to navigate to a document corresponding to your breakout room number. Within the document, you'll be able to find slides corresponding to your breakout rooms. The first page will be for general note taking so the group can keep track of the critical thoughts and ideas generated around each question. The second page is used to summarise your group ideas and actions and will be presented to the wider session after the breakout room. For this to work, we will need several people from each session to partake in note taking, as it helps keep a facilitator's attention on managing the session. Please remember your breakout room number, which will become apparent when we split into the breakout rooms via pop up. You should, if you should drop out for whatever reason, um, we can add you back into the group. Now, finally, on to the questions. These will also be easily accessible from within the breakout room chat as well as the note taking document, so no need to write these down now. Each room will be focused on a particular topic and focus on exploring these through the following questions. Question one Discuss and brainstorm your breakout room topic, identifying issues and architectural uh, potentials. 
end by identifying an umbrella ACAN aim that best suits the shape of your discussion. It might not be the obvious choice. So the ACAN aims, just to clarify, um, are decarbonisation, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. Question two, develop this topic and ACAN aim to define multiple actions, approaches and strategies that could be used to integrate into a range of briefs. Cool. So we are really looking forward to hearing from everyone um, about these questions. We should be about to put everyone in the breakout room shortly. Here's a reminder of the hand, hand signals. Great. Thanks, everyone.